History is filled with amazing and bizarre stories. From world wars to social history, there's a niche period that everyone can enjoy. With history comes mystery, and thanks to top scientists and academics, some of the world's greatest historical mysteries have finally been solved. On the morning of July 25, 2001, Residents of India were exposed to one of the creepiest moments in history. As the residents woke up and went about their normal routine, rain began to fall from the sky. This was to be expected, after all, they were in the middle of monsoon season, and heavy rainfall was anticipated. What they didn't anticipate was that the rain falling from the sky would be a rich, deep red color that resembled blood as it splashed onto the ground. The residents were in disbelief. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. Their clothes became stained and people fled indoors, fearing that the red rain could possibly injure them. It wasn't just red rain either. People all around the state reported seeing yellow, green, and black rain, and panic and confusion quickly set in. Locals reported that the red, yellow, green, and black rain came after they heard a loud thunderclap, followed by a bright flash of light. More worryingly, the residents reported that after this great flash of light, gray or burnt leaves began falling from the trees spontaneously. For 10 days, the mysterious rain continued. Locals reported that the red rain was localized and only lasted for a short duration. One area could be experiencing normal rain, while just a few miles away, red rain would be falling from the heavens. The Indian government were baffled as to what could have caused the red rain. People began speculating that the red rain was otherworldly and had been caused by extraterrestrial life or even an event deep in space. The Indian government hypothesized that the red rain was caused by debris from a meteor as each millimeter of rain contained 9 million red particles. Scientists were able to collect samples of the mysterious colored rain and analyzed it further. The analysis proved that the red particles were spores from a nearby plant. These spores had arisen into the atmosphere and combined with the rain. In 2013, another group of scientists found that the specific algae wasn't native to India and had traveled in the wind all the way from Austria. Finally, the mystery of the blood rain was solved. But who knows when one of the creepiest moments in history may repeat itself. The Mayan civilization and its downfall have been one of the most debated world historical mysteries. Hundreds of historians, scientists, and other academics have dedicated their careers to uncovering what happened to the Mayans and why they really abandoned their homes. In 2005, Centuries after the sudden collapse of the Mayan Empire, Jared Diamond put forward an interesting theory that prompted Arizona State University to conduct further testing. In his 2005 book, Collapse, Jared Diamond hypothesized that the Mayans didn't leave because of war or disease. Instead, he proposed that they left out of necessity to look for food and because they were living through an intense drought. The ancient civilization of the Mayans is believed to have had its origins as far back as 1500 BCE. The Mayan people thrived by developing agricultural methods and slowly settling themselves into larger and larger settlements that quickly developed into cities. Historians have estimated that at its peak, the ancient Mayan civilization was home to around 2 million people who thrived on the new societal systems set in place. Then, around 900 CE, the population mysteriously dropped, almost as if the Mayans vanished into thin air. For decades, historians have tried to piece together what exactly happened to the Mayans, and a 2012 study by the University of Arizona finally yielded some concrete answers. After hearing Diamond's hypothesis, researchers at the University of Arizona became intrigued and wanted to explore his idea further. They used archaeological data from Yucatan and discovered that around 900 CE, the area was experiencing a large drought. 
They also found that during this time, the Mayans had deforested a lot of areas to make way for more farms, which only contributed to their water issues. The Smithsonian explained, saying, quote, because cleared land absorbs less solar radiation, less water evaporates from its surface, making clouds and rainfall more scarce. As a result, the rapid deforestation exacerbated an already severe drought. After decades and even centuries of research, hard work and dedication, we finally arrived at a solid conclusion as to what happened to the ancient Mayan civilization. They didn't flee due to conflict or disease, but instead, they fled to find a more arable land to produce food so that their people could survive. 72-year-old David Lee Niles spent the evening of October 11, 2006 at Jake's Bar in Byron Center, Michigan. David and his friend spent the night at the bar drinking and engaging in casual conversation. In the months before October of 2006, David had been struggling with cancer and depression, and his friend wanted to do something to help cheer him up and take his mind off his problems even if it was just for a few hours. The pair sat and chatted for a while. That was until David got up and left without warning. He didn't tell his friend where he was going or why he was in such a hurry to leave. Sadly, after that, David was never seen again. Days passed and when friends and family realized they hadn't heard from David, they contacted the Kent County Sheriff's Office to file a missing person report. An investigation was launched, but as there was no sign of David, little came of their investigation. As the years went by, David's friends and family never forgot about him, and often wondered what had happened to him, and if he was still out there. Then, nine years later, on November 10th, 2015, Brian Hausman made a shocking discovery that would finally bring an end to the weird historical disappearance of David Lee Niles. Houseman was working on a tree that sat outside of the Cook Funeral Home in Byron Center. Across from the funeral home was a large pond. As Houseman carried out his work, he couldn't help but feel that he could see something submerged at the bottom of the pond. He tried to carry on with his work, but he was unable to shake that uneasy feeling from his mind. As he crept closer to the pond, he discovered the roof of a car sitting underneath the surface of the water. After realizing what he had discovered, he called the Kent County Police Department and told them to come to the scene right away. Hours later, the car was pulled from the pond, and investigators made yet another shocking discovery. Sat inside of the car were the skeletal remains of an adult male. The remains were sent to the coroner, who used dental records to confirm that the remains belonged to David Lee Niles. Shortly after, David's family were informed and funeral arrangements were made. The Kent County Sheriff's Office has ruled out foul play, but they're unsure of what happened to David that night. In a bizarre twist, investigators and residents found that David's submerged car had been visible on Google Maps since he had vanished in 2006. It turned out that the answer to their mystery was right under their noses. In a statement to the media, David's family said, quote, Why God waited nine years, I have no idea, but we're happy. It's good to have him home. For over 1,600 years, the Iron Pillar of Delhi mystified locals and scientists. The pillar stands at a whopping 22 feet and weighs around three tons. Many visitors have commented that from far away, the pillar seems like nothing special and that it's only when you get closer do you realize the scale and enormity of it. The pillar sits outside of a mosque in New Delhi, India. And while most people still debate how it came to be there, there is another mystery surrounding the pillar that was recently solved. According to the inscription on the pillar, it was brought to the site in New Delhi by King Chandra, who ruled from 375 to 415. Scientists discovered that the pillar is over 1,600 years old, meaning that the pillar was built and created elsewhere before being moved to New Delhi. No one knows for certain who moved the pillar or how they did it. The inscription on the pillar reads, quote, 
the residue of the king's effort, a burning splendor, which utterly destroyed his enemies, leaves not the earth even now, just like the residual heat of a burned out great forest. He, as if he wearied, has abandoned this world and resorted in actual form to another world, a place won by the merit of his deeds, and although he has departed, he remains on earth through the memory of his fame. The pillar has become an important historical landmark for the people of India, but the mystery behind who put the pillar there isn't the only one surrounding it. Being over 1600 years old, you would expect to see rust and wear on the pillar. However, that's simply not the case. The pillar in New Delhi has never rusted and for decades, residents were itching to know how this was possible as the pillar is made from iron. It wasn't until the 2000s that the people in India finally had their answer. A local doctor discovered that the iron was not pure. In fact, it sits at around 98% purity. As lime was not used in the smelting process, the phosphorus was never removed from the iron. This phosphorus then oxidized and reacted with the impurities in the iron and formed a protective barrier around the pillar and thus the strange historical mystery was solved. Had the pillar been made in more modern times, the phosphorus would have been removed and the impurities would not have been present in such high concentrations. So while the construction of this pillar used what we might deem as outdated methods, this is an example of when primitive methods have worked to our advantage. Can Grande de la Scala was a revered figure throughout Italy in the early 1300s. Scala had solidified his position by showing no mercy to his opponents, and in 1329, he marched into Treviso a proud man. He had recently conquered northern Italy and was slowly consolidating his power and planning how he could make the rest of Italy his. That was until he mysteriously passed just days after marching into the city of Treviso, on July 22nd, 1329. For centuries, his passing has been the subject of one of the world's greatest historical mysteries, with historians and scientists poring over the evidence to finally crack the case once and for all. Just days after his triumphant arrival, Scala began exhibiting symptoms of a mystery illness, he was vomiting and had a high fever, but no doctors were able to determine the cause of his mysterious illness. As the hours ticked by, Scala's condition worsened, and those around him remembered that he had drunk out of a polluted spring and blamed that for the illness. Hours later, he passed away, leaving a small power vacuum and a mystery that would span centuries. Some historians sided with the fact that Scala is believed to have drunk from a polluted spring and put his demise to a waterborne illness. Other historians believe that there was something more nefarious that happened. In 2004, Gino Fornaciari, a forensic pathologist at the University of Pisa, was approached by a museum to conduct an exhumation and autopsy of Scala. He agreed, and along with a team of researchers, he set about exhuming Scala's body. The team were able to recover biological samples from the naturally mummified remains of Scala, and toxicology tests performed on these samples held shocking results. Foxglove was found in these samples, and when ingested, it's lethal to humans. Other toxins were also found in these samples, indicating that someone had poisoned Scala. While we now know what caused the fall of the great leader, we still don't know who's responsible. Perhaps that's one part of a historical mystery that we will never solve. Sometimes not everything is as it seems, even when it comes to live TV. One example of such an incident occurred in March of 2016, while a live interview was being conducted at the Copenhagen airport in Denmark. The interview was being conducted by a reporter from the Danish television station TV2. He was talking to Klavs Jorgensen, who was a Danish national women's handball head coach. Behind him, other passengers can be seen collecting their baggage from the carousel, some with baggage trolleys at the ready, and others patiently waiting for their luggage to arrive. Among them are two women, one of which is Trine Jensen, one of the Danish handball players. 
she can be seen talking to another woman who has collected her luggage and is in the process of leaving the area. But as she crosses between Trine and the camera, something strange seems to happen. She takes one glance back and as she walks off, seems to disappear into thin air, leaving the station's viewers baffled. A clip of the incident was uploaded to the image sharing service Imager, where it received more than 3.3 million views and over 1,400 comments with people speculating about what had actually happened. Commenters joked about there being a glitch in the matrix, while others thought that the clip was a hoax and that the incident had been faked. But the truth turned out to be far less compelling. While Trine herself was questioned on what happened, she joked that she had the reflexes of a ninja, but she clarified that she realized she was standing in the middle of an interview and managed to slip away as smoothly as possible behind the other woman as she walked past the camera. She stated that she and some of her colleagues have shared a laugh about the clip and the response that it got after being filmed on live TV, debunking the mystery for good. In March of 2012, a live on-air report caused a stir among viewers of Fox 10's broadcast when the report was interrupted by a strange occurrence that left even the station's employees at a loss for a reasonable explanation. Reporter Andrea Robinson was in the middle of a traffic report from the station's studio with live pictures being shown on the screen behind her. Cars can be seen driving on the busy Interstate 17 highway and lights from the city can be seen glowing in the distance. But just before Andrea walks away from the camera and away from the screen, a bright white flash can be seen on the horizon behind her at around 4.45 a.m. The clip was shown by the station again later in the day, with the news anchor walking viewers through the event. He explains that it looks like an explosion and that their first thought was that it was a blown transformer that may have been responsible. He added that the station checked with the Arizona Public Service and Salt River Project, who reported that they hadn't had any trouble with their equipment that day. The incident was dubbed the Phoenix Lights Explosion, as it happened just a few days before the 13th anniversary of the famous Phoenix Lights UFO incident, in which a V-shaped formation of glowing lights passed over the skies of Phoenix. The incident was explained away by authorities as military flares that had been dropped by a fighter aircraft. Viewers guessed that the flash may have been caused by power lines that touched due to high winds in the area, or that it could have been the result of electrified rail lines, but it wasn't long before the mystery was solved. An employee of the Arizona Public Service contacted authorities to report that a breaker on an electrical line had opened. This resulted in a huge white flash of light and caused a very brief power outage in the immediate area. He added that their equipment didn't suffer any damage and that none of the area's power lines needed to be replaced. Some viewers were still skeptical, however, and questioned whether this was the actual cause or if the true reason for the flash was being kept from them. Pope Francis was elected as the head of the Catholic Church in 2013. He's been dubbed the People's Pope due to having a different stance on certain subjects compared to his predecessors. He stated that women should receive the same amount of pay as men. He's preached forgiveness for divorced couples and advocated for world leaders to take a firmer stance in the climate change crisis. On the 2nd of November, 2021, a video emerged showing a live broadcast from the previous year where the Pope was presenting a prayer directly from the Vatican the day after Easter Sunday. This was during the beginning stages of the COVID-19 pandemic, and during his speech, he focused on the role that women should be playing during the pandemic. The event was broadcast live and was later posted to YouTube, and it received attention from news outlets across the globe. But it was what happened at the very end of the prayer that left viewers in disbelief, and many thought that they'd witnessed a paranormal event caught on live TV. As the Pope turns away from the window where he'd been speaking to walk back into the Vatican building, he seemingly vanishes into thin air. One early commenter joked, saying, quote, nothing is real. Pope disappears into thin air. Others claimed that the Vatican had created a hologram of the Pope 
and that he hadn't actually attended the prayer in person, or that this was also a glitch in the Matrix. Some viewers even went as far as to claim that he'd been raptured. But when the full broadcast of the gathering was scrutinized, it became clear that his disappearance was caused by a video editing error on the side of the Michigan-based WWMT-TV's news broadcast, and the mystery was quickly solved. On the 3rd of January, 2007, the Australian free-to-air television network called Seven Network was broadcasting an episode of a Canadian television documentary series, Mayday, known in Australia and other countries as Air Crash Investigation. The series examines events that have happened during flights, such as crashes and other disasters, and they're reconstructed with the use of computer-generated simulations and imagery. The moments leading up to each incident are covered in detail, and experts as well as air crash investigators are interviewed to gain a better understanding of how each event was investigated, how they could have been prevented, and what impact they had on current aviation safety procedures. But during this particular episode, viewers were left confused when the program's audio seemed to be interrupted by an unknown source. A man could be heard praying in an English accent, saying, Jesus Christ, help us all, Lord. The same audio clip continued to play in a continuous loop for the next six minutes, causing several alarmed viewers to phone in to the station to complain. One such viewer, who was unable to reach the station telephonically, stated that he thought the signal had been hacked or that it was some sort of subliminal message that was being played in the background. When an investigation was launched by independent researchers, it was found that the audio was from a news broadcast of a civilian truck convoy that was ambushed in 2004 during the Iraqi war. The person that can be heard in the clip is Preston Wheeler, who was one of the drivers in the convoy. But a spokesperson for the channel later stated that they were unable to find who was responsible for the mix-up in the audio and they would only say that it was due to a technical glitch caused by an audio problem. They did, however, confirm that the audio was from the documentary. No further investigations were carried out, and no one was found to be responsible. On the 19th of September, 2017, a 7.1 magnitude earthquake hit Mexico City, causing massive amounts of damage to the city. Many buildings had collapsed, including the Enrique Rabzaman School, which quickly became the focus of attention during the disaster. Following the quake, rescue operations were quickly underway throughout the city, and rescue personnel as well as members of the public were hard at work at the school to help clear the rubble that was left in the massive earthquake's wake. The entire nation was captivated by a scary moment when the country's leading television news network reported that a 12-year-old girl by the name of Frida Sofia was trapped under the rubble, but that she was alive and awaiting rescue. Reporter Danielle Ditherbride broke the story, stating that she'd received the information from the leaders of the rescue teams at the site of the collapse. She was able to get the information firsthand as she was one of very few reporters allowed inside the restricted area that had been cordoned off around the school. She stated that the girl had been found with the use of thermal scanners that picked up on her body heat. She later interviewed some of the rescue workers live on air, one of which, only known as Artemio, told her that he'd heard the girl's voice and when he asked her what her name was, she replied, Sophie. Another rescue worker, Raul Rodrigo Hernandez Ayala, stated that the girl was alive and that her vital signs were good. Reports were later received that the girl was spotted in the debris by rescuers early in the morning, and that she was asked to move her hand if she could hear them, which she did. Many viewers on social media followed the events closely, with one Mexican YouTuber, Ryan Hoffman, tweeting, quote, Little Frida Sofia has survived 32 hours trapped under the rubble, fighting for her life. A real fighter. Soon she will be out of it. The rumors were further confirmed by Navy Admiral Jose Vergara Lara, who stated that Sofia had been located four hours after the rescue operation started. But the story quickly took a strange turn when reports started to surface that no one had come forward to claim the girl as their child. 
When the school was approached on the matter, they stated that they'd never had a student by that name enrolled in the school, and they were uncertain who she was. Nonetheless, the story gained traction, and Sofia became a symbol to the Mexican people that there is always hope, even in the face of such a large disaster. On the 21st of September, the Mexican newspaper El Universal reported that Frida had told the rescuers that she was thirsty and asked them to please not take too long to remove her from the rubble. But it soon came to light that Frida never existed. The following day, the Undersecretary of the Navy apologized to the public and confirmed that these reports were false, stating that the Frida Sofia story was not a reality. The story was thought to be a case of collective psychosis, where a delusional belief is transmitted from one individual to another, in some cases eventually spreading to an entire group of people. For centuries, the mystery behind the lost army of Cambyses II has baffled historians and archaeologists alike, but now it seems that the fate of these soldiers has finally been explained. Cambyses II was the son of Cyrus the Great. In 524 BC, Cambyses sent an army of 50,000 soldiers to destroy the oracle of Amun, a medium that served the god Amun. The army entered the desert in Egypt, but during their trek, something went terribly wrong, and they were never seen or heard from again. Speculation ran rife as to what had become of the army. But the Greek historian Herodotus decided on a theory that has been debated ever since. Herodotus speculated that the entire army had encountered a sandstorm so massive that it buried all 50,000 men in the desert. As unlikely as that sounds, no one has ever been able to offer a better explanation for the army's sudden disappearance. Until now, that is. Professor Olaf Kaper, an Egyptologist in the Netherlands, has always been uncomfortable with Herodotus's explanation, and he states that it has long been known that a person cannot simply be buried alive by a sandstorm. He adds that his research has shown that the army was, in fact, marching to the Dakla Oasis, where they were planning to confront the enemy army of Petabastus III. But before they could reach their destination, they were ambushed by Petabastus's men and defeated. Caper also believes that the sandstorm theory came to be thanks to King Darius I, who manipulated his people's belief toward the sandstorm theory. When Herodotus wrote his theory 75 years later, all he had to go by was Darius' account, and so the mystery was born. Caper's findings came about when he deciphered Petabastus III's full titles on ancient temple blocks, and they showed that there was indeed a stronghold at the Dakla Oasis at the beginning of the Persian period. When that was added to the already acquired knowledge of Petabastus III, they were able to reconstruct the events that wiped out the army, and the mystery was finally solved. The historical mystery involving Jean-Francois de Gallup de Les Perouses, a French naval officer and explorer, began in 1785, but the mystery of his disappearance has now finally been explained. During that time, King Louis XVI had heard of the success of Captain James Cook's explorations in the Pacific, and he wanted to prove to the world that France could be a force to be reckoned with as far as ocean exploration was concerned. And so he ordered de la Perouse to undertake a voyage to explore North and South America and Asia, with sponsorships from the king himself. De la Perouse was given two ships, and in August of 1785, he headed out to sea. The voyage was expected to return four years later, and first they sailed around Cape Horn. As they mapped coastlines and explored previously uncharted parts of the sea, De La Perouse sent back regular reports on his progress. Three years later, in January of 1788, they arrived in Botany Bay in Australia, where they remained until March. As they set sail once more, the ships were seen by a British lookout, but that would be the last sighting ever recorded. When no further reports were received from de la Perouse and he didn't return by 1791, the French government sent a search party to try and locate the two ships. But their efforts were futile. The ships and their passengers were never found, and de la Perouse became part of an unsolved historical mystery. Then in 1826, Irish Captain Peter Dillon 
bought several swords while he was traveling in the Santa Cruz Islands. He believed that they belonged to De La Perouse, and locals informed him that the swords came from a small island nearby where two ships had broken up. Here, Dylan found anchors and other parts of wreckage that were eventually proven to have belonged to both of the ships the men had been traveling on. This theory was bolstered in 1964 when a shipwreck was found and it was formally identified by another expedition in 2005. A final voyage was undertaken in 2008, using technological resources that had not been available previously. It was determined that after the two ships had wrecked, the men had their lives ended by local inhabitants. King Tut, the ancient Egyptian pharaoh, who ruled from 1332 BC until his passing in 1323, was buried with two daggers, one of which proved to be a true unsolved historical mystery upon its discovery in 1925. King Tut's reign wasn't one of significance, but when his tomb was unearthed in 1922, the treasure trove within ensured that he became one of the most well-known pharaohs in history. But among the jewelry, musical instruments, and other priceless artifacts, two daggers were found, one of which seemed out of place. The first was almost entirely made of gold, as would be expected for a pharaoh, but the other was seemingly made of iron, a metal that the Egyptians were still unfamiliar with since they were still living in the Bronze Age, and no proof has been found that they used iron in smelting until the 6th century BC. But analysis done in 2016, using an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, showed that the blade was made up mostly of iron, but it also contained 11% nickel and 0.6% cobalt, indicating that it was constructed from a meteorite. The golden dagger that was found was crudely constructed when compared to the expert craftsmanship of the more ornate iron blade. This would seem to suggest that it had been imported to Egypt, likely as a gift from someone living in a neighboring territory. And so, thanks to modern technology, the mystery of King Tut's strange dagger has finally been solved, and it can be seen at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, where it's been kept on display. On the 30th of December in 620 AD, people in Japan experienced a phenomenon that they described as a red sign, a streak of red light that appeared in the sky. And for the next millennium and a half, it remained an unsolved part of weird history. The light was considered at the time to be a bad omen, described by witnesses as comparable to the red fanned tail feathers of a pheasant leaving scholars baffled as to what the phenomenon was that they saw. But thanks to researchers from the Graduate University for Advanced Studies in Japan, an explanation has finally been found. One researcher states that many people believed it to actually have been an aurora. The problem with that theory, however, was that auroras don't typically look like the tail feathers of a pheasant, but rather present themselves as ribbons that wave across the sky like the famous Aurora Borealis. Another theory that was put forward was that it may have been a passing comet, but comets don't typically appear red in color. And so they decided to take a different approach to the problem, adjusting for the fact that Japan sat at 33 degrees in magnetic latitude when the light was observed as opposed to the 25 degrees that it sits at today. They added to that the fact that the pheasant's tail was approximately 10 degrees long and it became clear that it was situated well within an area that was affected by a strong magnetic storm at the time. Since it was recently discovered that auroras often appear in the shape of a pheasant's tail during magnetic storms, it is extremely likely that the witnesses had actually seen an aurora in the sky above them. In Japan, pheasants are considered the messengers of heaven, and since the aurora appeared in the sky and in that particular shape, it's understandable that the heavenly phenomenon was described in such a way. In 1853, a man working as a gum sapper in Guatemala stumbled upon the ruins of the city of Tikal that had remained undiscovered for over a thousand years. And with it came a historical mystery that remained unsolved until 2020. The city is located in northern Guatemala and at its peak, it was the capital of one of the most powerful Mayan kingdoms. 
However, the only water that was available to its people was whatever was collected when it rained and stored 10 reservoirs throughout the city since there was no access to any lakes or rivers. But by 950, Tikal was a deserted city with only a few people living in makeshift huts throughout the ruins. The reason for the abandonment of the city was a mystery that baffled archaeologists and anthropologists for more than a century. But thanks to researchers from the University of Cincinnati, an explanation has finally been found. The Mayans were known to mine cinnabar to create a red powder that was used as a dye. It was found to be present in the interiors of almost all high-status burial chambers in the city, with one grave containing as much as 20 pounds of cinnabar. It was also used in temples and the main palace, signifying that they were areas of high importance. But as heavy rainfall hit the area, dangerous amounts of powder seeped into the funnels that were created to supply the water reservoirs, poisoning the water that the Mayan people relied on so heavily. This would not only have affected their drinking water, but it also would have been present in food that had been cooked in the water. Added to this, researchers found toxin-producing green algae at the bottom of the reservoirs, further adding to the Mayan people's problems. It was found that during the 800s, the two central reservoirs were affected by phosphate, which blue-green algae need to survive and flourish. This was caused by cooking fires around the reservoirs, as well as the ceramic plates that were used and then washed in the reservoirs, adding organic material to the water. It was also discovered that a trash heap containing food waste was located so close to one of the reservoirs that heavy rains would cause runoff to enter the reservoir, and when the algae finally bloomed, the water became impotable. This would have been a catastrophic turn of events that was further exacerbated by the fact that the region experienced a drought between 820 and 870. Research shows that the sediment in which the blue-green algae and mercuric sulfide were found corresponds with this time frame. These factors combined meant that the Mayan people were out of options as far as drinking water and food supplies were concerned, and they had no other option but to abandon the city that had stood proudly for over 1,000 years. And so the mystery was solved. Researchers now intend to carry out similar tests at other Mayan settlements to determine whether they also suffered from a similar fate. For centuries, Stonehenge has baffled experts from around the world. Every few years, it seems, there is a new discovery that claims to solve one of the many mysteries surrounding the ancient site. There are still many factors we don't know about Stonehenge. Without written records, it's unlikely many of these questions will ever be answered. Despite many claims to the contrary, things like why the Great Monument was created will likely remain a mystery. However, there are some parts of the mystery that baffled experts have been able to finally solve. One of the things we now know for certain is where the largest of the standing stones originated. The larger stones at the Stonehenge site are known as Sarsen Stones. These make up the outer ring at Stonehenge. Sarsen is a type of material the stones are made out of, and it's a form of extremely hard sandstone formed by silica deposits. Typical ways of pinpointing where rocks come from don't work on this type of stone. Usually, under the microscope, a rock will show the same identifying markers as the outcrop where it originated. But under the microscope, all the sarsen stones look the same. Instead, scientists use x-rays to allow them to identify the chemical makeup of the rocks. That told them that 50 of the 52 sarsen stones came from the same place, but it was still impossible to identify that location. Scientists and archaeologists have a few pretty good ideas, but more information was needed. An intrusive technique that would have damaged the stones would have given them the answers, but obviously no one wanted to cause even more damage to the ancient structure. Luckily for researchers, somebody had already done just that. Restoration work had taken place in the 1950s. At the time, someone took a core sample of one of the stones, and one of the engineers took it back to the US to keep it in a private collection. Finally, in 2018, the core was returned back to the UK, and scientists were given permission to run some of the more intrusive tests. 
A more detailed analysis of the chemical makeup of the stones allowed experts to determine the stones had originated from a site called West Woods, a patch of woodland in Wiltshire. How exactly our Neolithic ancestors moved the stones from their place of origin to Salisbury, where Stonehenge was built, is still a mystery that baffles scientists. Experiments have proven the smaller blue stones are capable of being moved by a sleigh pulled by less than a dozen people. But it would have taken a lot more, and would have included pushing or dragging the stones up an incline to the final destination. As experts continue to investigate this famous structure, it's likely more of the puzzling secrets from Stonehenge will be uncovered. But many more will remain a mystery. The disappearance of Le Griffin is one of the biggest mysteries from the Great Lakes. It was the first large sailing ship to explore the upper Great Lakes, and in 1679, she disappeared without a trace. Some claim that it was cursed by Native Americans, while the owner of the ship believed that sailors had stolen her cargo and sunk the ship itself. For centuries, what happened to the ship and where it lay remained a mystery. Finally, in 2018, a couple who had dedicated their lives to finding the supposedly cursed ship found the wreckage that they believe would solve the mystery. Le Griffin was a ship owned by Sieur de La Salle. La Salle was the man responsible for claiming most of France's territory in the Americas, but one of his main goals was to find a passage through the continent to the Pacific Ocean. Le Griffin was supposed to be the ship that would finally achieve this goal. In August of 1679, she set sail on her maiden voyage with more than 30 men, including La Salle, on board. The goal was to set sail to an island on Lake Michigan, where they would pick up beaver fur from a friendly native tribe. The plan was for the fur sails to fund the further exploration of what they hoped would be a passage to Asia. Rather than traveling back north with his cargo, La Salle decided to stay behind so he could further explore the area. There were just six crew members on board as the ship sailed back with $12,000 worth of cargo. He was headed towards the Niagara River on September 18th when she was last seen before disappearing from view. Nobody would see the ship again. It wasn't long before rumors began to form about what had happened. Allegedly, a prophet told the explorer that the ship had been cursed and would sink on the lakes. Some of the people who had been with La Salle believed a four-day storm was to blame for the sinking, but La Salle believed the people he had entrusted with the ship were responsible for its sinking. The discovery of the ship's wreckage would have put all the rumors to rest, but for centuries, Le Griffin's location was a secret that only the lakes knew. Steve Liebert spent most of his adult life searching for the ship, before finally finding what he believed to be the wreck at Poverty Island. The Griffin expert had spent decades researching ships from this era, and believed the wreck closely lined up with what had been written about Le Griffin. The wreck also contained what appeared to be building material for another ship, which Le Griffin was known to be carrying when she vanished. The local government and other archaeologists disagree that this is really Le Griffin. But if she is, then it seems to suggest a storm really was responsible for the sinking, rather than any of the conspiracy theories that have been developed over the centuries. For experts and historians, some of the most puzzling mysteries are the ones that don't seem at first to have much of a consequence. But when it comes to the authorship of words that have been repeated on monuments and war films, it's understandable why historians might want to remove any doubt. This mystery concerns a short letter that was written to a grieving mother during the American Civil War. In November of 1864, the governor of Massachusetts told authorities in Washington about a widow that one of his generals had met. She had lost five of her sons in the Civil War, and he believed her sacrifice was so noble that the president should acknowledge it. Someone in the White House apparently agreed, and a letter to the widow, Mrs. Bixby, was written. The same day that Mrs. Bixby received the short letter, it was published in the Boston Evening Transcript. The letter was just three paragraphs long, but it moved the hearts of many who read it. The line, quote, I feel how weak and fruitless must be any word of mine which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming, was praised as being extremely poetic. 
It was signed A. Lincoln, and for decades, it was assumed the president himself had written it. The Bixby letter was held as an example of the most well-written prose by any president. But it wasn't long before people began to doubt that the letter was actually written by the president. Many believe that instead, the Bixby letter was written by the president's secretary, John Hay. Historians on both sides of the argument tried to compare the letter to writing by Hay and Lincoln, but it was too short for linguistic forensics to be sure one way or the other. Hay had allegedly told a number of people, but sworn them to secrecy, and left behind no evidence that this was the case. In 2017, the mystery was finally solved by experts at the University of Manchester in the UK. Using a technique called in-gram tracing, they were able to determine once and for all that it was Hay who had written the letter. The technique uses computers to analyze hundreds of short texts from both Hay and Lincoln. Even though the Bixby letter was too short for normal analysis, the computer was able to look at words and phrases that were there, and what ones were noticeably absent to determine the authorship. In 90% of the tests conducted, the analysis confirmed Hay as the author. The other 10% of tests were inconclusive. While the mystery surrounding the Bixby letter may not seem too important, this new technique could be used in the future to determine the authorship of texts in criminal proceedings, like threats of violence, messages from mysteriously missing people, or even confessions. The last thing archaeologists expected to find buried under Lower Manhattan was a colonial-era ship. But during excavation near the former World Trade Center site, that's exactly what baffled experts found. The wooden vessel was almost destroyed during excavation, but luckily archaeologists on the site recognized the wooden boards weren't just random pieces of trash. The skeletal remains of the ship were carefully removed from the site before fresh air could ruin the delicate timber. Experts had a few ideas about what kind of ship the vessel was. But for years, the truth about it would remain a mystery. After careful analysis and studies from researchers at the University of Columbia, the date the ship was constructed was to be pinpointed. From that, a brief history of the ship and how it came to be buried 22 feet below ground was built up. Scientists analyzed tree rings in the timber to determine the date the trees were cut down. Many people know that counting tree rings can determine a tree's age. But the size of each ring can tell scientists important information about the climate. Trees in different regions will all show the same pattern of growth. When comparing the tree rings from the ship to known samples, scientists were able to determine that the wood had come from an old growth forest in Philadelphia in around 1773. The same forest also provided wood for Philadelphia's Independence Hall, which was built about 20 years earlier. Given wood is usually used within a few years of being cut, historians agreed that the ship had been built around the same time. It was a Hudson River sloop used to carry passengers and cargo on the river, but was scrapped after a few decades of use. Whether it was due to shipworms that had burrowed into the wood, or because it wasn't needed anymore isn't known. It was abandoned off the coast of Manhattan, then used as part of fill when the Manhattan shoreline was extended. It wasn't uncommon for old merchant ships to be used in this artificial land. Over the years, it was forgotten and buried so deep that it wasn't even discovered when the construction on the site had originally taken place. After the careful removal of the ship, experts finally solved the mystery of how it had gotten there, and it was put on display at the New York State Museum. The Scream is one of the most famous paintings in the world. Painted by Edvard Munch in 1893, for more than 100 years it has sparked conversations about mental health, anxiety, and existentialism. But in the world of art, it was known for the mystery that baffled experts. On one version of the painting, a tiny inscription written in the painting can be seen in the upper left corner. It's only when a viewer gets up close that the faint pencil strokes can be seen. Written in Norwegian is the phrase, could only have been painted by a madman. It was first noticed in 1904, but believed to have been written after the painting was first created. For more than a century, who wrote the small phrase has baffled experts. 
It was thought that it might have been a visitor to the gallery where it was featured, or even an art critic. At the time, the painting had gotten a lot of criticism from art critics. It was completely unlike anything from the time, and there was definitely talk about Munch's mental health. Munch had deeply been troubled by this, and would write letters about overhearing people speculate about his mental health. He did have a nervous breakdown at one point and was committed to a hospital for a time. Mental health problems ran in his family, and he was also dealing with the loss of several family members. However, modern techniques revealed that it was Munch himself that had written the comment. While the painting had been prepared for a museum, infrared photos of the artwork were taken. Examining the inscription and comparing the handwriting to letters written by Munch, experts are now confident that Munch wrote the comment himself. The mystery of the inscription has now been solved, but that doesn't make the artwork any less powerful and intriguing. It can seem like there's a never-ending number of mysteries from ancient Egypt, but every year experts are able to reveal more and more secrets. An archaeology mystery that has been unsolved for almost a century appeared to get its answer in 2020. The mystery surrounds a strange artifact found in the tomb of King Tut. When British archaeologists discovered the tomb in 1922, it was the first ancient Egyptian tomb that was discovered undisturbed. While the most magnificent artifacts that had once been housed in other tombs had been stolen over the millennia, those that had been buried with the boy king had survived untouched. One of the items found was a breastplate covered in silver, gold, and ornate jewels. At the center of the item was a scarab beetle made out of a unique gemstone. At first, the stone was believed to be a rather flawless example of chalcedony, a common gemstone. But as experts looked into the item more, it was clear this wasn't the case. What the gemstone was remained a mystery until 1932, when another British researcher found what's today known as Libyan desert silica glass. The naturally created glass was discovered in one of the most remote parts of the Sahara Desert, along the border of Egypt and Libya. Such glass is naturally occurring, but only under extremely specific conditions. A volcanic eruption or a meteor impact are the two most common forms. Essentially, the minerals that the glass is made from need to be superheated then rapidly cooled so no crystals have time to form. The only problem was there was no evidence of either of these in the area where the desert glass was found. The creation of the desert glass that had been used to create the incredible beetle remained a mystery until 2020. Researchers analyzing satellite images found a strange structure in a remote part of Egypt. As the structure was analyzed, it became clear this wasn't some kind of optical illusion. Looking through different lenses allowed experts to analyze what kind of rocks would be found in the structure. It was determined that there were only three ways such a structure could be created. It was either man-made from a nuclear blast, a volcanic eruption, or a meteor impact. Looking back through old satellite images, experts were able to rule out the first possibility. This was natural, not man-made, and it had been there for millions of years. More research needs to be done to solve the mystery once and for all. However, all research that has taken place so far indicates this was a meteor strike, and one of the best preserved specimens of a crater. The conspiracy theories about ancient aliens building the pyramids has been disproven, but it seems like one of the most incredible artifacts from the era may have come from outer space. For decades, experts were baffled by an ancient mystery in the Pacific Ocean that defied explanation. It wasn't until 2013 that scientists realized the assumptions they made were wrong and something entirely unexpected was discovered. The mystery started with scientists researching ancient Earth. Rock cores from the sea floor can be used to look back in time. Experts discovered a sudden burst of life in the North Pacific Ocean 14,000 years ago. This was just after the last ice age. The ocean was teeming with microscopic life like phytoplankton. It all appeared very suddenly. Then a few hundred years later, the bloom disappeared as mysteriously as it had appeared. The only traces left behind were the skeletons and shells that floated down to the sea floor, 
and would eventually become part of the rock cores used to study the time period. The strange appearance and disappearance left scientists scratching their heads. Even though the mystery occurred 14,000 years ago, solving it was seen as important. Phytoplankton are actually the main producers of oxygen on Earth and consume a large amount of CO2. Figuring out how to help these tiny creatures would be a huge step forward in managing the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. For a long time, it was believed iron was responsible for the mysterious bloom. Creatures like phytoplankton don't only need sunlight for photosynthesis, but nutrients like iron too. Today, this means the creatures are almost exclusively found near continents where minerals are blown or washed into the ocean. Experts thought the melting of ice and the rise in sea levels would have led to a burst of iron in the water. That would have led to the mysterious burst of life but wouldn't necessarily have explained why it disappeared so suddenly. Scientists then began a study that would look into where the theoretical iron came from. Iron from China would leave a different mineral behind than iron from the US. It was during this study that the experts made their unexpected discovery. There had been no bloom of iron. Instead, iron levels had been decreasing since the end of the Ice Age. Instead, scientists discovered it was the perfect blend of circumstances that led to the mysterious bloom. Global temperatures rising had changed ocean currents and led to nutrients from the ocean floor, mixing with water near the surface where there's enough sunlight for photosynthesis. Cool water from the ice melt then stopped the mixing. After a hundred years, the nutrients that were churned up had been used up, leading to the mysterious bloom disappearing. The discovery solved the mystery and answered some questions experts today had about our modern environment. Ever since it was first discovered in 1901, the Antikythera mechanism has intrigued archaeologists and other experts who have tried to uncover the secrets the mysterious object might have. It was only decades after it was discovered that we understood the true extent of this incredible machine. It wasn't just an intricate clockwork piece, it was the world's first analog computer. The machine was discovered by divers searching for sea sponges off the coast of the Greek island of Antikythera. They discovered a never-before-seen shipwreck which was filled with statues, coins, and jars that dated the ship to the 1st century BCE. Among the artifacts was a strange lump of rusted metal. The divers didn't think much of it, but when it was brought onto dry land, experts realized it was something incredible. Archaeologists were able to figure out that this was used to track the movements of the sun, moon, and planets for ancient Greeks. But how it was created remained a mystery. Having been at the bottom of the ocean for almost 2,000 years, there was plenty of wear and tear on the artifact and only about a third of it remains. What remains comes in the form of more than 80 pieces. In recent years, experts have been able to shed some light on that mystery. The first big break in the mystery came in 2016 when x-rays and other scanning devices were used on the machine. Inscriptions were discovered on the device, written in ancient Greek. The inscriptions were fragmented, but experts were able to decode them to reveal a form of user manual that explained how to read the face of the device. Another key part of the puzzle was that two of the disks, those corresponding to Venus and Saturn, were in a good enough state that researchers were able to figure out how they worked. Over the years, many groups had tried and failed to put together the rest of the evidence. It's made somewhat more complicated by the fact that the ancient Greeks put the Earth at the center of their cosmos. So the device had to account for things like planets appearing to move backwards throughout the sky. Recently, experts at the University College London used computer models to create a device that fit all the known parameters of the Antikythera mechanism. It tracked that there were then the five known planets, the Sun and Moon, as well as the movements of the Zodiac. It was a huge breakthrough that allowed scholars to see what this mysterious device may have looked like for the first time. There are still mysteries that remain unsolved though. A computer model is one thing, but experts are still working on replicating the device in the real world. The biggest mystery of all, who actually created the device and why, may never be solved. 
According to experts that worked on the case, solving the mystery of the 1258 event was like a criminal investigation. They had the crime, they had lots of evidence, but finding the culprit wasn't easy. 1258 was a devastating year for much of the world. Chroniclers in Europe described famine, crop failures, and diseases. Even to them, it was obvious the terrible weather was to blame. But why summer didn't appear that year was a mystery to them. Similar stories were told around the world. Years later, climate scientists would find physical evidence of this year without a summer. In ice cores from both the Arctic and the Antarctic, they discovered ash and other sediments that could be dated to the same time. There had been a devastating volcanic eruption, one that had changed the climate around the world. But the exact volcano remained unidentified. If solving this mystery was a criminal investigation, scientists had found the bullets used in the crime, but now they needed to match those to the weapon itself. Given the global impact, the volcano had to lie near the equator. That way, winds from both the southern and northern hemispheres would transport the ash and gases from the volcano around the world. There were a few candidates for suspects. A volcano in Mexico and another in Ecuador were considered. But looking at samples from these volcanoes and tree rings in the surrounding areas determined that either the chemical makeup of the ash was incorrect, making it the wrong weapon, or the time of the eruption was off. Neither of these volcanoes were the culprit for the mysterious event. Scientists then began investigating a volcano in Indonesia. Before any scientific analysis would take place, local history told experts this was promising. Old records told of an eruption on the island of Lombok, which destroyed a prominent kingdom there. There's little evidence of Lombok's volcano, beyond the crater lake that was left behind after an eruption. But scratching beneath the surface, experts found the evidence they needed. Samples from the site had the same chemical makeup as those found in the ice cores at the poles. Tree rings also indicated the eruption that took place here took place at the right time. It was one of the biggest eruptions in human history, and the biggest of the last few thousand years. Anybody with even a passing interest in the Renaissance will know the name Medici. The Medici family were some of the most important people in Italy at the time, and the de facto rulers of the Florentine Republic. But the course of history could have gone very different if one event in 1478 had gone differently. The significance of the event and who was really behind it remained a mystery for more than 500 years. In the 1470s, Lorenzo de' Medici was the head of the family, a powerful politician, poet, and philosopher. His younger brother Giuliano stayed out of politics, but was well-liked and helped the Medici family stay in power. Of course, not everybody liked the family, and with power came enemies. In particular, the rival banking family, the Pazzis, were keen to see the Medicis get out of their way. This was despite the fact that the Pazzis and the Medicis were related by marriage. In April of 1478, Francesco Pazzi concocted a conspiracy that he thought would get rid of the family once and for all. He needed to get rid of both of the brothers at once, but getting them in the same place at the same time was hard. One attempt had to be called off when one of the brothers pulled out of the event. Mass on Easter Sunday was chosen as a backup plan, which made some of the conspirators get cold feet. Nobody wanted to commit such a terrible crime on holy ground. In the end, Pazzi himself was the one to commit the act. He sat next to Giuliano in the cathedral. After Mass had started, he attacked the younger Medici brother with a bladed weapon. Another conspirator was supposed to attack Lorenzo, but Lorenzo got away mostly unharmed. The Pazzis believed the general population would support them as they got rid of the Medicis, but this was far from the case. The population of Florence fought back, and the Pazzis and their allies were gotten rid of. For centuries, it was believed the case was closed and justice had been served, but that wasn't true. It wasn't until 2004 that the mystery behind the case was really uncovered. A letter was discovered in a private archive in the city of Urbino. Urbino was ruled in the 1470s by a mercenary named Federico de Montefeltro, 
Montefeltro had made a name for himself as a humanist and was another key figure in the Renaissance. The letter was encrypted as it would take years before it was cracked by experts. What they found was shocking. It was a letter from Montefeltro to Pope Sixtus IV, urging him to go ahead and take out the Medicis. It outlined their scheme to get rid of the brothers and take over the political power. The Pazzis were puppets that Montefeltro felt they could control. When the scheme backfired, Montefeltro apparently didn't push the matter further, and his secret would be safe for another 500 years. The mysterious disappearance of the SS Cotopaxi has inspired numerous theories and horror stories over the almost 100 years since it vanished. Its final journey before it reached a watery grave was supposed to go from South Carolina to Cuba. The path would have taken it to the supposedly dangerous Bermuda Triangle. When the Bermuda Triangle theory was eventually born, the Cotopaxi was added to its list of potential victims. But in 2020, Researchers announced that this creepy history story had been solved and there was nothing supernatural about it. The Cotopaxi was a cargo ship built during the First World War. It began its career towards the end of 1918 and would spend the next seven years transporting coal and other cargo along the east coast of the Americas. On November 19, 1925, it began its final journey. Like so many other trips, the plan was to take coal from South Carolina to Cuba. Two days later, it sent out distress signals. There was a tropical storm in the area, and the ship was taking on water. No help arrived in time, and the Cotopaxi vanished, taking her crew of about 30 men with her. The disappearance and history mystery didn't get too much attention at first. It seemed to be a tragic accident, but not too uncommon. But as the legend surrounding the Bermuda Triangle grew, the story of the Cotopaxi was pulled into it, much like the legends claimed that the actual Bermuda Triangle pulled in the actual Cotopaxi. Over the almost 100 years since it disappeared, stories of ghost ships still visible on the coast of Cuba were attributed to the lost ship. Many suggested the Bermuda Triangle's supernatural powers were responsible. In reality, the story of the Cotopaxi had been solved long before anybody realized there was an unsolved story. In the 1980s, a shipwreck was located off the coast of St. Augustine, Florida. It was dubbed the Bear Wreck and was a popular destination for adventurous scuba divers. But when marine biologist Michael Barnett took a look at the wreck, he believed he could identify it. He took video footage, measurements, and photographs and compared them to the ships that had gone missing over the years. It seemed to be a pretty good match to the Cotopaxi. Another diver found valves which appeared to have come from the Scott Valve Manufacturing Company, a company set up near to where the Cotopaxi had been built. Michael also went through old documents about the case, discovering that the families of the sailors lost aboard the Cotopaxi had sued the company that owned the ship back when it was first lost. It was known at the time that the hatch covers on the ship were broken. The covers would have prevented the ship from taking on so much water and were due for repair, but the trip to Cuba went ahead anyway. In 2020, it was finally confirmed that the bare wreck was actually the Cotopaxi. It had never gotten close to the Bermuda Triangle. But while this history mystery didn't involve the famous triangle, that doesn't make it being solved any less satisfying. In 2022, a 42-year-old mystery was finally solved when a lost artifact was finally recovered. What makes this history story so strange was that most of the missing artifact was found decades earlier. It was the early morning hours of November 7, 1980. The Church of Santo Domingo in Spain was empty. With the exception of one career criminal, René Alphonse Vandenberg had earned a nickname in Spain, Eric the Belgian. He was a talented art dealer, painter, and restorer, but his love for art had taken him down a criminal route. He led a group of thieves who would steal artwork, particularly religious artwork, and that was what Vandenberg was doing in the church that morning. He stole six large tapestries, the largest of which was four meters by six meters. This large one was the apotheosis of art and depicted the muses of classical liberal arts. 
The other five tapestries focused on a single one of these muses. An investigation began as soon as the theft was discovered. Interpol led an investigation that took them across multiple European countries. Within a couple of years, all six tapestries were recovered. The only exception was a 2 by 2 foot square taken from the corner of the Apotheosis of Art. The corner piece featured a cherub and was part of the border that surrounded the main picture. In 1942, Vandenberg was captured by authorities in Spain. He was imprisoned for three years before he agreed to help authorities track down many of the pieces he had stolen. Some of the biggest mysteries in art crime were solved, but the missing cherub remained elusive. Why Vandenberg decided to keep this particular location a secret is still a mystery. Authorities continued to try to bring an end to the weird history story, but they believed the cherub would remain lost forever. The tapestry was hung back in the church with the square clearly missing. It wasn't until 2020 that the unsolved mystery came under focus again. A police officer who was studying art crime decided to take a crack at solving the case. He contacted one of Vandenberg's lawyers. The infamous art thief had already passed away at this point. The lawyer informed the police officer that he knew exactly where the piece of art was. The lawyer led police to the fragment, which was still in relatively good condition, beside the fact that it had been cut from the tapestry. Earlier this year, it was returned to the church where it belonged, and the Church of Santo Domingo theft could finally be classed as a solved mystery. The USS Lexington played an important part in the Second World War, specifically in the Pacific Theater. She was a part of a historic moment, the first air and sea battle, and became the first United States aircraft carrier to be lost during the war. But her loss led to victories in other Pacific battles, and gave the Americans the advantage later during the war. After Lady Lex vanished beneath the waves, her location became a historical mystery that wasn't fully solved until 2018. The USS Lexington was one of the first aircraft carriers created for the United States opening up a new period of history for warfare. She entered service in 1928 and helped the US practice and develop strategies for the best use of this new type of ship. When the US entered World War II, she put those tactics to work and was involved in a number of battles before joining the Battle of the Coral Sea in May of 1942. The Battle of the Coral Sea was mostly a fight to stop the Japanese from taking over Papua New Guinea and other nearby islands. Both sides took heavy damage, and the USS Lexington was put to good use. Even after being hit with artillery on both sides and suffering a catastrophic fire, she continued to launch aircraft which took down Japanese ships and planes. Ultimately, the Allied forces were able to repel the Japanese. Japan would survive to fight another day, but they had their fleet severely reduced during the battle which gave Americans the advantage in later battles, like in the Battle of Midway. Despite this, there was no saving the USS Lexington. 2,770 sailors were able to escape in the slow-sinking ship before she was scuttled to ensure that she would fall into enemy hands. 216 crew members would lose their lives during the battle. The Lexington would remain at the bottom of the ocean for decades, while another ship, originally intended to be called the Cabot, took up the name and served until the 1990s. Despite its role in such an important historical moment, it wouldn't be until 2018 that she was finally found. Billionaire Paul Allen had already funded expeditions to find other lost ships, including the famous USS Indianapolis. Locating the USS Lexington was high on his list of future goals. After months of planning and searching, the Lady Lex was located 430 nautical miles off the coast of Queensland, beneath two miles of water. Today, she remains there, and there doesn't appear to be any plans to change that, but the mystery can finally be solved. During a routine archive at the start of 2001, Cambridge University Library staff uncovered a strange true crime story. At the time, they couldn't be certain if this was really an unsolved crime or something less sinister. It wouldn't be until 20 years later that the case would finally be solved. 
Cambridge University Library is home to the biggest collection of manuscripts that once belonged to Charles Darwin. It describes the collection as not only important to science history, but to humanity's history. Among these manuscripts were the transmutation notebooks. These were the notebooks where Darwin first theorized about how species might evolve from their ancestors to future forms. Notebook B included a sketch of the Tree of Life, showing how one common ancestor could be connected to dozens of species. They represented an important part of the true history of the world. The notebooks were about the size of postcards. Notebook B and C were kept together in a small blue box, about the size of a paperback book. In September of 2000, the box was removed from storage for photography. That photography was completed that November. It was assumed by museum staff that the notebooks were returned to their correct locations. But the true location was a mystery. In January of 2001, a stock take took place, and staff realized the notebooks were missing. Given the millions of books and other items at the library, it was assumed that they had simply been misplaced. For years, there would be searches, but none were thorough enough to convince staff that they weren't still in the library. Finally, in 2020, a more exhaustive search took place. It still couldn't be ruled out that they had simply been misplaced, but it seemed likely that they had been stolen. An appeal for information was made, and the items were listed on Interpol's list of missing artifacts. But they would be worth millions of dollars, but it would have been impossible for them to trade them on the open market. News of the true crime made headlines around the world, but there was little progress made on the case. That was until March 9th of 2022. A pink gift bag was left outside the librarian's office, outside of security camera view. Inside, staff found a brown envelope. Typed on the envelope was the phrase librarian, Happy Easter, X. Contained in the envelope was the box that the notebooks had originally gone missing in. The notebooks were wrapped in cling film. It didn't appear to have been damaged or heavily handled in the years that they were missing. The library staff were elated to have the unsolved mystery solved. But the strange but true story of these notebooks isn't over. Cambridgeshire police are still looking for the person responsible for taking the notebooks. It seems likely the crime was perpetrated by someone familiar with the library. It may have been a university prank that went on for far longer than the culprit expected, or someone who had been unable to sell the notebooks to a collector in the intervening years. Police hope they might have made a slip up that would allow the mystery to truly be solved years later. When a horrifying true crime story began on the streets of Raleigh, North Carolina. For more than four decades, it would remain an unsolved cold case before a breakthrough finally came in 2014. Ralph Smith was a 51-year-old taxi driver and loving father to three children. One October evening, while his children were at fair, Ralph was at work doing his job as a taxi driver. At some point, he picked up a man in his late 20s and drove him to East Bagley Street. But when it came to the end of the journey, the passenger decided that he didn't want to pay. He tried to skip out on the fare and a fight broke out, with a single bullet striking Ralph. He would not survive. Residents in a neighboring street heard the shot and went to investigate. Police were called and the investigation into the crime began. Unfortunately for the Smith family, the case quickly went cold. A robbery was ruled out as he still had money in his pocket and his own weapon lay untouched on the seat beside him. There didn't appear to be much in the way of evidence, at least not anything that could be used in the 1970s. The Smith family would later say that they heard no news after about a month. The case became an unsolved mystery, though the family held on to Ralph in their memories. It wouldn't be until July of 2014 that they would hear any more news. Ralph's wife, Effie, and one of their daughters were returning home from the store when they found a police officer waiting for them. He revealed that they had finally caught the person responsible for taking Ralph's life. The man's name was Sinatra Dunn. He had been in and out of prison in his youth, but in the 1980s had been approached by missionaries and had since found God. How exactly police came to suspect Dunn is unclear, but they confirmed that they had enough evidence to bring him to trial, and in July of 2014 he was arrested for the crime. 
He confessed at trial and apologized to the Smith family. The family agreed to a plea deal, and he was sentenced to 12 years in prison. Though it could never bring Ralph back, they were glad to get closure, to have the mystery solved, and see that Dunn had found God. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.